because here I am, once again, I'm this big, strong, even though I'm not that tall, I'm a big, strong police officer in my own mind, right? Um, I got all the same machismo every, every, that everyone else has. Uh, I feel as if uh, I'm supposed to have the answer as a, as a police officer. I, I was a captain, uh, you know, and here I am being humbled by this, these little vessels in my heart. You're listening to the Black and Blue Podcast, a discussion and celebration of the roles of African Americans and other minorities in U.S. law enforcement. Your host on the Black and Blue Podcast is Dale Peters, a law enforcement professional with over 20 years experience in the business. Hop on board this Black and Blue train of interviews, current events, and pop culture conversations. So get ready. The Black and Blue Podcast is coming at you right now. All right, fam, welcome back to the interrogation room, Square Pegs. My name is Dale. I'm the host of the Black and Blue Podcast. Thank you for joining me here today. I got somebody on the other side of the country who's really special. He's got a lot of experience. Everybody, please help me welcome in retired captain after 24 years in, the, in the, like I said, in the state of Connecticut. Help me welcome in Lawrence Hunter. How you doing, sir? I'm good, man. Good, man. Thank you for having me on the show. I really yeah. appreciate it. So I mentioned you out in uh, Connecticut. How's things treating you out there in Connecticut right now? Well, you know, we're all kind of going through this virus type of uh, shelter in place thing. But uh, besides that, the weather is finally broken. It's nice out. It's about 80 degrees. Uh, you, we had to deal with the cold winter but uh, out, out here. But everything is good now. And uh, I'm enjoying retirement and just kind of living life, you know. All right. So you had uh, 24 years. What, what department did you work for? Yeah, Waterbury, Connecticut, Waterbury City Police. Yeah. Okay. Where yeah. where's that in relation to everything for us that don't? Uh, know? well, it's it, Waterbury's kind of kind of funny. It's like twenty minutes from New Haven, uh, twenty minutes from well, maybe like thirty minutes from Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, it's about an hour and a half from New York City, okay, and about two hours from Boston. So it's kind of a good location for all all of that. Yeah. All right. What what what's the size of it? How how large is it? Uh, so it's about 115, 110,000 people. Um, and the department uh, was, um, when I first started, we had 350 cops. Then we had budget cuts and all that kind of stuff. We got down to about 270. But right now, they're back up to about 300. All right. How long have you been retired now? Uh, retired last February. So it's a little, been a little bit more than a year now. Okay. And And how's retirement treating you? Retirement is good, um, but honestly, I miss law enforcement, man. Yeah. I really didn't think I would miss it this much, but I miss it a lot. I'm actually, I'm actually uh, looking to try to do something to get back in. What that's going to be, I don't know yet, but uh, I may, I may, you may see me wearing a uniform again one day. Really, really. I have to shave the beard off, depending yeah, on where I go. Yeah. But, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that looks good though. I like that on you. Yeah. I like well, that thanks, on you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, you want to get back in the game, huh? Well, yeah, you know, I this podcast, well, I also have a podcast, too. And uh, so I've been talking so much about law enforcement, discussing my career, uh, the things I'd like to see in, in law enforcement, the changes that I'd like to see. And so what better ma- way to make changes than from the inside? Uh, so uh, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, I've got some challenges to go through. and I've been out for a year. So so we'll see what happens. All but, right. So what, what's the name of your podcast so we can all tune in? Yeah, the name of my podcast is Captain Hunter's Podcast. Uh, on that show, I just kind of discuss community issues and as well as the police issues, right? The tagline is uh, bridging the divide between the police and the communities that they serve. And I also want to emphasize that the that the police actually serve the community, right? Yeah. So sometimes <laughs> that gets lost, that narrative gets lost. But, uh, but as long as I think that police have the right guidance and the right frame of th- thinking, and that is that they actually serve the public, then I think that we can make some great strides. Yeah, no no doubt, no doubt. And so you retired, uh, Captain Hunter, so you retired as a captain? That's correct, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, all right, so mm-hmm. what else What else did you do there in your career? Uh, so while, while I was there, I spent the majority of my time in patrol. Uh, I was a field training officer. I was a communications dispatcher. Um, before our communications department, I, I, we had officers who would work inside there. Um, and so I did that for a little while. And then 
uh, it, and it's since been privatized, so officers don't do that anymore. Um, so, but the majority of my time was was just in patrol. I worked the majority of my time on the midnight shift. Uh, when I, when I got uh, promoted to sergeant, I stayed in the midnights, uh, even though I had to rotate most of the time. But whenever I could, I stayed in midnights. And of course, the lieutenant. Uh, I said, actually, when I was a lieutenant, I spent the majority of my time as a supervisor on the first shift. And then as a captain, I, I finished my career as the midnight shift commander. And the reason I stayed on midnights is because I enjoyed being home with my kids while they were home. Uh, when they got off the bus, they knew that daddy was there and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I also was able to coach them, coach a number of their leagues uh, and just be be that dad that was home all the time. Keep them out of trouble. So, yeah. But was that hard on your on your body clot? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's yeah. no there's no doubt about that. But I mean, but it was worth it. I mean, the the connection uh, that I have with my kids and their uh, productivity in life, I think, is has been worth it. And uh, my my daughter is just uh, getting her associate's degree. My stepson is graduated from college with a bachelor's. My son's in the military, so I think that the effort and the sacrifices that I made uh, to make sure that they uh, I grew up to be productive citizens was well worth it. And I would do it again, but yeah, it was hard. There were some days I didn't get any sleep. Yeah, no uh, doubt. No hard. doubt. Now, uh, did they work, uh, three twelves, four tens, five eights? What did they work over there? Uh, yeah. So we worked, f- uh, five days a week, five, two, five, two, and then five, three. So five days on two days off, five days on two days off, and then five days on three days off. Um, so that kept us in the rotation type of thing. Yeah. And for the most part, the majority of the th- midnight shift, uh, which was about, uh, you know, 10 to 6 or so. Um, we stayed on that shift, be- and we all did it for the same reason, because we want to be family. Now, if you worked the first and second shift, then every two months they would rotate between first and second, and then go to first shift to go to second shift, second shift to go to first shift. But we as third shifters, we didn't want that. We want to stay exactly where we were. Um, so there was no rotational part of that. Yeah, a little that stability, huh? Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. What's uh what's like the uh divisional the demographics of uh of the city and the department as a whole? Uh so uh Waterbury is you know, if you think of it like a, a mini city, mini America, that's really what what Waterbury is. Uh the majority is white and white, but white is mostly Irish and um Italian. Um, and then there's a large Albanian population as well. I don't know the exact numbers. And then, uh, you know, there's a large black and, and Hispanic, my Hispanic, I mean, mostly Puerto Rican um, uh, population. Um, so that, that's pretty much the demographics of Waterbury is black, um, Puerto, Puerto, Puerto Rican, uh, Irish, Italian. So that's pretty much what they are. And the department? Uh, so when I left, uh, the department was... I mean, we had probably like 25 black officers, maybe 25 or so, 25, 30 or so Hispanic officers, and the rest were white. So uh, just like any other place, we had the challenges of making sure that that um, our our department reflects the city. But it, but I, all in all, I wouldn't say it was bad. I mean, there was no, uh, of course, I always want more more black officers, more minority officers, right. but you got you got to take the test and then pass the test. So that challenge is on is on other people. Yeah, so I, w- I wanted to talk about that as well. What's what are the challenges of, of you know recruiting black officers, minority officers into the department? I know that's it's hard generally across the country now, but uh, you know specifically recruiting black officers, Hispanic officers to the department. Yeah, so uh, actually before I uh, I retired, that was uh, one of my assignments was to go out to different colleges, universities, et cetera, and just try to uh, convince people to uh, take the test. And, you know, when I went to college and universities, obviously you're speaking with, you know, whoever walks by or whether you're in, we were in the cafeteria or, or in some major thoroughfare where, where people were passing by. And the majority of people who were taking the applications or showed some type of interest were, were white people. And so uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of African-Americans. And for a number of reasons, I, I believe this is going on throughout the whole country, are just not interested in law enforcement. And I think that's because of the viral videos that we're seeing and all that kind of stuff. So I think that um, one of the best ways to um, uh, to recruit more African-American officers is to uh, really go out to where they are, the churches, the barbershops, the colleges and all that kind of stuff. And just try to be that convincing ear that, hey, listen, we need to make those uh, types of cha- changes and challenges and problems that you see with law enforcement from the inside. You're not going to get we're not going to get anything 
uh, from from sitting on the sidelines and moaning and complaining and saying, okay, the police ought to do this, police ought to do that. You got to make those challenges from the inside. And I also had a had a discussion with uh, a, a lady on on my my podcast. Um, her name is, uh, gosh, what is her name? Uh, Sonia. Jeez, oh, hold on, you got to edit this out. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> Sonia Pruitt, she's a captain from uh, in uh, the police department in, in Maryland. Sonia Pruitt, and we had actually a really good discussion. I asked her similarly the same question, and she, in her experience, and I would have to say this is also a true experience, is that in her experience, when she was part of the recruitment team, is that uh, many times black officers uh, in were being uh, overly scrutinized, right? So let's just say the the parameters to have to go for the job application was to have a bachelor's degree. Well, then there was extra steps taken by people within her department and or her city uh, saying, OK, well, yeah, OK, this guy's got a bachelor's degree. But look, uh, he took this English class and he got a C. So there's some over scrutiny going on with that. Now, I sat on my uh, uh, board as far as um, uh, the recruitment process. So we discussed all these types of things. And I had the, the chance and the voice to speak up and say, listen, we're not going to, you know, knock somebody off the list because when he was 12, he tried to smoke weed. We're not, we're not, right. we're not going to do that. You know? So I think that just, we need a, a fairness across the board, about how we're going to recruit. We need a concerted effort to, to recruit. Um, and then once again, just to be fair in our, in what we're going to do. Yeah. I've seen uh, some studies and some stories about, you know, talking about recruitment of minorities and uh, a lot of it has to do, you know, with passing backgrounds and, you know, that's due to the policing in those areas before, you know, these, these people, these candidates come through, you know, they, they, they're getting sweated and, and, you know, for traffic tickets uh, that, you know, other communities wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, scrutinized for. So then in these lower income communities, they can't pay the, the fine. So these things go to warrant. And then when they go to warrant, they get arrested. And now they have that on their record. Whereas opposed to, you know, other parts of town where they wouldn't have been getting stopped and, uh, you know, for these for these minor violations uh, in the first place. So a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, the policing in the area to begin with in these lower income neighborhoods. So, yeah, that, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've, I'm sure that I read something very similar. In fact, I talked about it on my uh, I talked about it in a show that I did in talking about there was a there was a uh, I think it was the Chicago Defender or Tribune or something like that. They did a story expressing exactly that. And I think one of the ways to com combat that is obviously more black officers need to step up. Community members need to step up and understand what's going on and why uh, so many officers are being, uh, uh, you know, eliminated because of this nonsense. And of course, as you mentioned that, um, you know, it really comes from the direction of the top of the department and who we're going to ticket, who we're going to, right. uh, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of these problems that we see within law enforcement come from the top and it takes a loud voice and loud voices to say, listen, we want fairness and equity. If you're going to stop one person because they've had a number of tickets, then you're going to stop everyone. Or we should eliminate this kind of this kind of thinking. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, you got a podcast, but you also what else are you doing here in retirement? You have something else, uh, a leadership institute or, or something like that. Why don't you tell us. About yeah, that? so I started a business in which I'm helping people, number one, to become police officers. Right. So sometimes people don't know the process and. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I, I, I talk about this a, a lot is that um, the, uh, when I was um, and the reason that we go to churches is because when I was a young kid, I was like 20 years old or so. They, they, we read the church announcements and the one of the church announcements was, hey, the police test is coming up. The fire test was coming up. The uh, There's a water department test coming up. So, you know, we, we would be able to put in for all these tests. Of course, I took the police test and passed it. But a lot of people are not able to afford to go to college. Uh, uh, they're not in a place where they think they need, need to go to college or they can't afford it, or maybe they can't go to night school or, or, or whatever. Um, so I, I, I put together some classes uh, that is online. I mean, I had to, you know, kind of get paid for what I do, <laughs> but they're, they're really, really affordable. And for people who are out there who don't want to go through, um, you know, a, two years of schooling, you can sit through my course. Uh, it'll take you a few days to sit through it. Um, and uh, you know, I kind of elaborate about what it takes to become a police officer, how to pass the test, uh, how to prepare for the physical agility and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think that I really did a good job in trying to help people to become police officers, uh, because I know that some people can be turned off because of, they think that there's this academic process to it. Um, 
in addition to, to, to taking a test. So that's one aspect of the business I started. It's called LMH Police Training and Consulting. And the other part of it is, yes, the leadership portion of it, where I'm putting together right now uh, some leadership videos of people about people who want to, you know, excel at just leadership, just generally. Now, this uh, is not just geared towards, uh, at least I'm not trying to gear towards law enforcement, right? There, you, you, somebody could be just been promoted to the manager at McDonald's. Um, what, you know, what do you do? How do you, yeah. how do you handle that situation, right? You're 25, 26 years old. You got to uh, uh, supervise some 18 year olds. How do you do that? You know, may, they may not know anything. Once again, maybe their the challenges in life have not allowed them to uh, um, to go to college and, and take some some higher education courses. So I'm putting together something that will be a little bit cheaper. Um, so, but they can understand what it takes to be a leadership and leadership qualities. And finally, uh, another thing that I, that I discuss is people who want to take promotional tests in law enforcement. And uh, again, too, if you, somebody wants to do something that's outside of law enforcement, you know, what does it take to get promoted? Uh, how do you go about studying? What to study? Um, maybe some people are, are very good test takers as far as the written portion of the test, but they seem to bomb the oral port presentation or, or vice versa. Um, so, uh, so those are things that I can help people with and, and I've helped. Uh, and been successful in helping other people take and pass those. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to ask you. All three phases that you were just talking about, have you seen success stories along the way? Well, uh, so I just put out the video as far as uh, the video series, as far as people who want to become police officers. I had a brother who took it and he's uh, he's going to be writing me a, a, a little write-up for my, for, my, for my website and everything. But uh, he was just actually finishing community college. You know, I asked him, you know, how, of course, I do the survey at the end. How did you like what, what I need to add, take away? He said, you know, everything was just perfect and just right. And he learned so much more about, about the actual testing process. You know, uh, the colleges, uh, and this is not to knock them, obviously, but, they, but, they, but they're focusing on the long term, you know, what criminal justice is, the U.S. Constitution, state constitutions and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about what yeah. it takes to be a cop, you okay. know. Um, so, so. Um, in that regard, I mean, because of this COVID thing, I've just released it, so I haven't seen any success with that because people don't have money to take it. Uh, there's yeah. no test being given and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, there, I, ha I have worked with a number of people who have taken my uh, courses as far as um, uh, promotional exams, and uh, they. Uh, w one of my good friends, for a matter of fact, um, is a is a sheriff in uh, Mecklenburg County. Uh, we, and in order to become a, uh, when it, what I would call a street sheriff, right? So you're driving around in the cars. When he first starts out, he was a um, uh, working inside the county prison. So in order to work on the outside, essentially, uh, he had to go through an oral board presentation part. And he, he took it two or three times. Huh? So I'm like, listen, brother, <laughs> yeah. let's get on, let's get on, let's get on Skype and let's let's work through this, man. And let's let's and I hope you work work through it. Uh, you know, it, he didn't really take my course per se, but I helped him and, and walk through it. How, how do you answer these questions? What they're really asking you, right? So if, even though the, uh, uh, a question may come up, they're they're really asking you something else, or a one question really has five different layers to it. So I break all that down. So once I did all that, and so of course he got promoted. Now I would call that a promotion, um, yeah. and then other people were actually promoted to different uh, ranks and sergeants and things like that. So I have seen some success. Yes. All right. Good deal. Good stuff on there. So uh, what, what drew you, in particular, to law enforcement in the first place? Man, I was one of those kids, man, that kind of wa grew up watching uh, Miami Vice and uh, <laughs> Law and & Order and stuff. So I'm probably dating uh, myself, right? So, um, no, but I'm yeah, right with I, you. I'm right with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I grew up watching that stuff. And, you know, I said I, said I always wanted to be, uh, you know, I, I said I wanted to be an FBI agent. Um, but uh, when I graduated from high school, you know, I didn't go straight to college or anything like that. So I kind of went to community college route. Um, but then, like I said, when the, uh, the uh, test came up, I said, you know what, Hey, I'm not really doing anything else. I always kind of thought about this. I took the test and passed it. Um, and it's something I really enjoyed ever since. Now, I can't say, I mean, besides the, you know, watching TV and stuff, there's, I really didn't have a burning, burning desire to become a police officer. It was something that came up. Uh, I said, you know what, I, I and I'm going to take this test. I excelled at the test and excelled in the career. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, were there some mentors along the way that kind of helped you? Yeah. So when I came out on the department, right, so there was um, uh, there were a couple of lieutenants, black lieutenants. Uh, we had what we called the guardians, uh, um, uh, just a number of black officers. And so these lieutenants took all of the newer, younger officers under our wing. Now, I got I came on in 1995. 
And this is right in uh, with the crime bill that was passed, you know, the 94 crime bill. So it was uh, whatever, t- trying to get a million more cops on the street or whatever mm-hmm. it was. So there was a push to get um, a number of different officers on the street. So I was a part of that particular group. And so we had seen a, a, a a dramatic increase in the number of black officers and Hispanic officers as a, as a result of, and in female officers as well. Right. So, um, so these, uh, officers, these black lieutenants came up and they kind of schooled us and told us about the ropes and all that kind of stuff and how to become, uh, more productive and all that. All right. And have you been able to do the same when you uh, in your tenure? Yeah. So right before I left, uh, you know, we, you know, it's, now it's our turn. Right. So we had to kind of reach back. I, I reached back. I, I still reach out to the couple of guys now, just kind of check in from time to time, see how they're doing, make sure that there's they have any questions or if there's anything I can do to help. Um, you know, I'm there for them and try to give them that wisdom. But these these young brothers, man, there's one young brother who's there right now is a sergeant right now. He's, he's a bright brother. and He's He's really destined for greatness, and and they're, they're taking the ball and, and and running with it, which is which is very good. And I think the true test of any type of leadership is really when you prepare people for your departure, right? Yeah. And so um, you have to really have to be able to train your replacements. And so uh, these brothers, uh, particularly one, well, there's a couple, but 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 uh, they really are on the ball, and they're really doing um, some some good and great things. All right. All right. So uh, I know we talked about earlier, you know, family was really important. You know, I see those uh, that picture behind you. Is that is that yeah. to, to your <laughs> yeah. kids there? How did, yeah, how, did they, my, how did they feel about dad being a being a cop growing up? You know, I don't think that they that they thought about it. Yeah, that's that's them. They did a caricature when they were in uh, Vegas that they didn't invite their dad to. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's another story for another day. Yeah, that's <laughs> another story. And I don't blame. Him. I probably wouldn't invite my dad. Nah, either, no, no, no. Um, but uh, but. Um, I don't think that they thought about it very much. The only time that they thought about it is when, um, you know, when they get start getting older and then, you know, they had, you know, they're talking to their friends and they're saying to their friends, Hey, you know, listen, come over, play in my house, you know, come over my house, play some video games. I'm like, nah, your dad's a cop. It's like, yeah. And so, <laughs> so they didn't yeah. really put that connection, that fear together. Um, because I listen, they, they really, I mean, not until they got older, um, did they ever see me in uniform? Because like I said, I was home. And then when they go to bed, that's when I go to work. So they really didn't put that connection. And a lot of times, uh, I did not even I didn't wear my uniform to work. I got, got dressed at work. So they and I didn't do that because of any secretive or type of reasons. Like that's just the way that it worked out. Um, so they didn't see me until I was actually until they were older, you know, 16, 17. And that's when I start working a daytime shift and I come home for lunch or something along those lines. That's when I actually saw and probably put that connection. Hey, my dad's really a police officer. You know? Right, so, right, right. Yeah. Did they have any kind of questions, uh, you know, about, you know, like this viral stuff or controversial things that happened in law enforcement where they, them or their friends wanted to talk to dad or, you know, see what, what your feeling was in law enforcement perspective? Yeah, I don't think that they, uh, yeah, I don't remember any of those kind of things coming up. I think that when uh, Trayvon Martin was killed, I did talk to them and we had a long, nice long discussion, especially with my son. Uh, we talked about that kind of thing. Um, and if I don't remember anything in particular, I will tell the story about one time that, um, they were a little older, seven, my son was about 17 or so. And so they, he, and I think three other boys, like four of them went to a, um, a house party, you know? And, uh, so the police get there and they shut down the party. And, uh, so my son is, I think they were waiting for some girls who are sitting outside and they're, you know, not leaving the party fast enough. And the cops come over and say, you know, what's going on? Show us your ID and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, once they get their IDs, they start running their names. And of course, uh, they come across my son's name and it's my son's name and it's the same as my name. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, okay. Oh, everything's all set here. So they're getting the IDs and they kind of skedaddle. So I talked to my son after that, and the, the, the boys, the other kids outside, uh, were, were really upset. So I, I went outside, talked to them, and said, "Listen, um, this treatment that you got, you know, you, it, it may have gone worse, but because the officers knew who I was, and I live in the same city uh, that I that I that I work in, um, this treatment that you got." It could have been worse, but you have to know how to talk to police. You have to know, you know, what, you know, be respectful, know how to talk to them, know what they're saying. Yes or no, sir. Um, but also be mindful enough to get badge numbers, uh, car numbers, um, names and all that kind of stuff. So that was that was a, 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 an, 
a realization for them because I think that a lot of times kids are, are really kids and t- until, you know, as we know with uh, black young men and women, you reach that certain point where you're no longer viewed as a kid anymore. And of course, being 17 years old, uh, this was a realization for them. And so when I go out there and tell them uh, the information that I told them, um, you know, they, they were very grateful and thankful. My son, you know, said the, the next day, said, you know, th- we want to thank your dad for coming to us, telling us this, because no one ever told him this before. And I felt good and bad at the same time, because this is something that needs to be, needs to happen. And what, another reason why I started the podcast is because I want to have these conversations where I want people to tune in, to listen and understand how we should treat one another, how we should talk to the police, how we should interact with the police, because unfortunately it's not being done enough. And if this was the first time that these 16, 17, 18 year old kids were hearing this type of information, it could have been the first time and the last time that they had to run in with law enforcement, if that makes any sense what I'm it, saying. Right? Yeah, it does. You it know, does. Things can go can go really bad really quick. And if you don't understand the dynamics of this relationship, then then you know things can go downhill fast. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've got a 17 year old now. So, you know, having those discussions, because he's driving now, having those discussions, you know, what you what you do, how you interact. Um, you know, I live in the same city as well. So, you know, a number of cops know him, but he goes, you know, in a car now. So he can go to the next city over, uh, go all the way to L.A. And, you know, it may not be the same uh, interaction. So you got to know what to do, how to interact, um, you know, where to keep your hands if you get pulled over and all that type of stuff. And that's not just because he's black. You know, it's just, you know how anyone should act, you know, um, don't make any further movements, any of that type of stuff. So, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah so I, I actually think that that should be part of driver, driver training ed and in, in, in all, in all, I really do. Yeah, I, I really yeah. believe that. I mean, I, I sat with both my, my kids, you know, because there's a portion of driver's ed in, at least in Connecticut, where there's a portion of it where the parents have to be there and they're showing, they, they show the kids, ha- uh, you know, different car accidents, all this kind of, so I knew exactly what, what was being taught the whole time. And I was thinking that this, you know, interaction with the police and how to get pulled and what happens when and if you get pulled over really, it, it really is vital. I mean, I'd be certainly more than volunteer, willing to, to volunteer to teach these classes, but, but that's really important. And as you mentioned, not just for black kids, but everybody should know, you know, that you got to keep your insurance where it is. You got to show, you know, all yep. this kind of stuff. So, yep. so, and, and that, that should actually be maybe even a f- refresher course, you know, from time to time. But, yeah. There's a, there's a dude out here um, with breaking barriers is what he's called. Uh, he's out here in California, but uh, he does a lot of things. I'm going to try to get him on the show too, uh, where he goes to different schools and he talks to kids about interactions with law enforcement, you know, cause a lot of them are seeing these, these viral videos and, uh, they're thinking, you know, well, this should have happened or that should, and you know, people always say, well, they should shot him in the leg and, all that type of stuff. So he actually goes through scenarios with them and where, you know, he puts them up in a, you know, in a vest and gives them, you know, some, some red guns or whatever. And they're the cop. And he's the person in the car that's mouthing off and got the loud radio going and, and all that type of stuff and how they would react if this were to happen or, you know, just letting them see from, from this, from the other angle. So it's, it's really instrumental, really, really cool. So I'm gonna try to get him on too. So good stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah good stuff. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, coming up, you didn't want to be a cop or how, oh, how, 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 did, um, how, did, how did the family view you as wanting to be in law enforcement? Uh, yeah, um, they were very supportive of it. I mean, they, I don't, I've, you know, it's kind of funny because my grandmother, um, she, uh, she was kind of weird about it, but uh, by weird, I mean, she, I don't know if she thought it was a phase or what, because... <laughs> At the same time, like, uh, you know, I, I was actually, I came on when I was 22. So I started to shave my head because I was one of those people that kind of lost my hair very at a very young age. And so she's like, and so I, at the same time, I cut my hair and I was very active in church. And of course, now I'm going to the police academy. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, yeah. you cut your hair off. You, you try to be in the gang. I'm like, grandma, I'm going to be a cop. I'm going to police academy. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was weird. So, but, but none, none of them were, were, were talking me out of it. I came from um, a very good, productive family. Uh, everyone worked. My, my, I had an uncle, matter of fact, I'm named after my uncle who worked in the post office. Uh, my, my, my aunt worked for the, uh, for the, for the uh, state um, uh, tax uh, office in Hartford, Connecticut. 
Um, so I so I had nothing but positive uh, members of my immediate and you know extended family. So uh, the church was very supportive of it, and there, there was no one who talked down about it in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Okay, yeah, I like to say you know because I'm I'm bald too underneath this, and uh, <laughs> you know I started way back when during the the Michael Jordan era. I was trying to be right, Mike, right. I was trying to be like Mike. So, well, I, uh, you know what, Mike, Mike really did set the set the set the the example there because yeah. that's exactly what I did. I'm like, listen, I'm going to police academy. Uh I'm gonna be away from, from home for six months. Nobody knows who I am. I'm going bald anyway. Let me just and, and, and Michael Jordan's doing it. It's a it's a fad. <laughs> Let me just go ahead. Yeah. Fortunately, fortunately I had a you know decent shaped head so I don't look funny. So yeah, it's, exactly. it all worked out. <laughs> exactly. Mine was voluntary back then, but as I started getting older now it's a little involuntary. I gotta okay. <laughs> I gotta do it now to <laughs> but yeah that's the way it is uh you know so what was uh what was uh kind of the most rewarding part of your job back when you when you were working? Uh rewarding, man, that's that's wow, that's a good question. So rewarding, I would say um knowing that I actually help people. I mean, you know, sometimes uh, I, I I'll put it like this. So it's definitely helping people. Whether I got a note, sometimes people would write in saying, you know, thank this officer for this, that, and the other. And when I got promoted to, especially as a lieutenant and a captain, um, seeing the same rewards, I would actually now read those types of letters uh, when people would write in and say, thank you to this officer because he was, he was so patient, so kind. And so uh, just th- the embarrassment that we would have at roll call when it was read about us, I was now able to give that same embarrassment out and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I would, I would make him feel you know, kind of crazy. You know, hey, listen, uh, officer so-and-so, step forward. Everybody take a look at Officer So and So. I just want to read this letter here, and they, you know, everybody, they're blushing like crazy and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so I enjoyed that kind of thing. So I enjoyed actually helping people. I enjoyed watching uh, and knowing that my officers were helping people. I enjoyed making them feel good at roll call and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I enjoyed that. All right. What was uh, one of the most more challenging parts of the job? I think the challenging part of the job is uh, it, probably the exact opposite of that is when we were faced with. Um, allegations of excessive force or allegations that we uh, weren't doing something correct or accused of cover-up. I, I remember as a lieutenant one time, I got a phone call of, uh, and this lady was she's telling me she's taking my call and is the police department in league with this particular restaurant owner because we wouldn't make them turn down the music and all that kind of stuff. So I was always frustrated with that kind of thing because I know, and, and this is something I know that many officers are going through and dealing with, is that we're all, the vast majority of us are trying to do the right thing day in and day out. And so when we're accused of having, uh, you know, different motivations or being uh, uh, racist or, or on a take, or that, that really frustrates me because yeah. I know that we're all trying to do the right thing and really trying to help people. You know? Right, right. Definitely, definitely. And then on the flip side, since you've come out of law enforcement, you know, retired, what's, what's been more, one of the more challenging parts of, you know, your daily life now? Daily life now, um, man, that's a good question. <laughs> what is more challenging about my daily life? Probably trying to come up with podcast topics, trying to come right. up with podcast hopes, <laughs> hosts. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, I really miss law enforcement. So that's that's it's actually a very good, very big mental challenge for me as to what I'm going to do as far as whether I'm going to get back in law enforcement or, or not. Um, so I miss it a lot. So that's that's really a, a big challenge for me. Okay. All right. What uh, what opportunities do you see, you know, for African Americans and minorities in law enforcement in the future? I think the sky is really the limit, man. I mean, I think that we we're we're becoming chiefs. Every time I turn around, there's some new black chief getting sworn in, especially black female chiefs getting sworn in. I mean, it's um, uh, so I don't think I I don't think that there's really any limitations as long as we keep pushing. Uh, for fairness across the board. And I'm, by fairness, I mean everything has to be fair from the academics of little kids, right? Th- those uh, second and third graders need the same opportunities to education, same a- opportunities and access to uh, good foods and all that kind of stuff. And so therefore we can move into anything that we want to be in life, law enforcement, military, uh, be firefighters, uh, stock uh, brokers, whatever we want to do. So I don't think that there's any uh, limitations to it. And we just have to keep that up. I think that the only limitations that we're going to be faced with are those in our own mind. As, as I talked about, those people who don't want to be police officers are those who, as you meant, as you asked me, 
uh, was anyone against me becoming a police officer. Um, any family member that discourages people from becoming police officers or and or entering the military, and while I, while I understand it, I I, I, I can't disagree with that m m more. Mm -hmm. I think we sh that's that's all the more reason to join the military and or the police department or the fire department or become a teacher or whatever, because we see so much wrong with it, be the answer, right? So enter yeah, into law enforcement. And so the only limitations that we have that I can see going forward are, are just going to be in our own minds. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, you know, on the family side, it's the danger. You know, I know my mother was, was really worried when I first decided I want to go into law enforcement, you know, uh, worried about her only son, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe getting injured or killed, but externally, a lot of it has to do with, you know, what they see on TV, what they think, you know, about law enforcement. So, you know, I always try to preach, you know, let's be the change, you know, let's be the answer and not the, not the, not the problem. I, I absolutely agree. My mother did have some reservations about, it. I think she hit it well. Um, but uh, yeah, and I don't want to make it seem like uh, people weren't concerned about that. I did have an uncle uh, who did say something to me, well, not even an uncle, he was actually a, just a very, close family friend uh, who would say, you know, how can the police do this? And how can the police do that? And I understood what he was asking, you know, <laughs> you all on the yeah. take or, or y'all just sitting around eating donuts. And all that. I understood what he was trying to be nice about it. So, so it was a good opportunity, but, and my mother did say some things or, or at least she tried to hide the fact that she was concerned, but I, I you know what, I was there uh, for five years before I got promoted to the rank of Sergeant. And once I explained to them, okay, now I'm going to get promoted to Sergeant. And, and that kind of breathed, had a different uh, sigh of relief because they understood that I was not going to be in the first line as much anymore. And then when I got promoted to lieutenant, they breathed a little bit more <laughs> sigh of relief, uh, you know. Yeah. So, so I mean, listen, it is what it is in law enforcement is uh, there is a danger to it. It's nowhere near any there's I mean, you can be a what is a park park worker or forest ranger or something like that. And and um or, or uh, you know, construction worker have a greater access to danger than than being a police officer, just sure. statistically speaking. Anyway. Right, right. And but on that note, had uh, your department experienced any any deaths, any in the line of duty deaths? Um. So in 1992, there was a police officer who was killed. And remember, I came out in '95, so that's still fresh in people's minds, right? It's three years later, but it's still fairly fresh. Yeah. Um. And so. Um, in my department, there was people who died um, while working of various diseases, but but line of duty deaths as far as being assaulted or killed by guns, no. Uh, we did have um, two persons who committed suicide uh, while working. Um, but, um, and of course, Connecticut's fairly small, right? I, I think that uh, uh, Southern California is, uh, I think LA is probably bigger than all of Connecticut. Yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably, so, so probably, probably so, my county is bigger than yeah, Connecticut. Probably, but. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. So, um, so something happens, and so the police officer gets killed in, let's just say, East Hartford, Connecticut. You know, Waterbury is right there. So it's so it's um, you know something happens in one place, and it happens very. You know, we all kind of take it, and yeah. so like I mentioned, New York City is very close, and so a lot of people have a connection to New York City, especially the Hispanic Puerto Rican population. They all have cousins in New York, so we all we all know what's going on, and so therefore, we, because we're so close, you know, we, we understand that the danger. Yeah. Um, but there was only one line of duty death, as far as that, a couple of suicides, and, and all. Did Did you guys participate in the cleanup and all that of nine uh, eleven? Yeah. Um, after a while, uh, we had officers going down there so much that, in fact, uh, uh, the the powers that be down down there in NYC said, "Stop coming to help," because they got so much help. After a while, people couldn't couldn't do anything to do. Uh, find it, they didn't have enough for them to do, and so I remember being I was a sergeant at the time when nine eleven happened, and I can remember um, telling officers uh, that. Not to, uh, I think, was that sergeant? I might have been a lieutenant. And anyway, so um, uh, we, we had to stand up a roll call and say, stop going down to New York City. <laughs> they don't want you there. Stop going down there. Uh, of course, people still went, you know. But, yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, that was a crazy time. So, yeah. It was definitely a crazy time. Yeah, yeah. And then you touched on suicides. You know, that's a big problem as well in, yeah. uh, in law yeah. enforcement. You know, all the stress and and all that at the job and, and being the, you know, the type that we are that don't want to ask for help and talk about it, you know, that kind of just weighs on you further and further. That's a big problem too. 
Yeah, absolutely. I actually um, I had gone to a number of classes about that become and setting up different programs. And I highly recommend that any department really look into any type of behavioral uh, health, mental health program that gets officers to talk, uh, peer programs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you re- that really, really is very, very important. Um, and one of the persons uh, who really hurt us bad was a guy that I, he was a year or two after me, but he ended up becoming uh, our deputy chief and he killed himself. And that was really, really something that we uh, had a hard time getting through and, work- and working through. Um, but, uh, but yeah, mental health, man, is really, really something that's, that's big, that's important. We all need to 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 get that help. Sometimes there's that uh, machismo that we don't want to seek help, and so um, we, it really is something that's necessary. Um, if I can tell a story, um, one of the reasons that I did retire is because I had a triple bypass um, about two years ago. So I'm, that's about the time that I'm like, you know what, I, I'm going to call it quits. Well, I'm glad um, you're still here. I'm glad you're still here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Me too. And so. Going through that, there really is a post-traumatic stress disorder that goes along with that. And people can read about that. But um, people who have heart conditions or heart attacks and stuff. And I actually went through that very, very bad. I actually had to go talk to someone because here I am. Once again, I'm this big, strong, even though I'm not that tall, I'm a big, strong police officer in my own mind. Right. Um, I got all the same machismo every, every, that everyone else has. Uh, I feel as if uh, I'm supposed to have the answer as a, as a police officer. I was a captain. Uh, you know, and here I am being humbled by this, these little vessels in my heart. And so I, it really took me a long time to work through that. And truth be told, I'm still working through it. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I understand that mental health and the things that we go through, uh, really are difficult for people to, to handle. Um, but there's an importance to joining organizations and going to church, speaking with someone, confiding in the best friend in taking the positive routes to met to medication rather than the negative routes by negative routes, obviously drinking or drugging or, or whatever. Um, and police officers can develop these different addictions that everyone else can. No one's above that. Yep. And so, um, so I, re- I really want to stress people get the mental health that they need and don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Don't be so tough. Don't think that uh, people are going to think less of you, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So how's your health now? Uh, it's, it's much better. Uh, I just, uh, started a, what they call the whole food plant-based diet. Okay. Uh, so I'm hoping to see if that will do some reversals. I'll go for walks just about every day and working out back to lifting. Uh, well, at least push-ups and sit-ups. I try to do that home gym kind of stuff, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, all that kind of stuff. Uh, health is good. Taking my medication and I'm going to see if this whole pl- food plant-based diet, what I just started, uh, can get me off these medications. Because once again, I'm thinking I'm a big tough guy. And I don't want to take these medications for the rest of my life, but I'll do what I got to do, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, th- that, uh, plant-based diet is going to be a big change for you as well. I'm sure you, yeah, you yeah. Ate a so lot I'm a- of, yeah. I'm about I'm about three weeks in, and listen, I wasn't in I wasn't in terrible shape before. Matter of fact, uh, I just uh, had a discussion with a lady, and I was telling her the same, uh, and to tell her about how the 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 uh, how I found out about my problem. You know, I was going for walks in my neighborhood, and so there's little these little hills in my neighborhood. So I'm trying to do the hills. I you know go up a hill, go back down, go up a hill. So I'm doing that, and and uh, so one day I just couldn't do it. I'm like, I do this hills every day. How come I can't do it this day? And this shoulder pain. So I come home, I rest. I'm like, I, I feel good, but let me just call the doctor. So I called the doctor up and you know, to do what they got to do, do, run me a stress test and all that kind of stuff. And they found three different, uh, uh, clogged arteries in my heart. So, I, and so I'm telling the, the lady this, and she's a registered dietitian. She's like, the fact that you could do <laughs> the hills says that you were in great shape. Because you had, you know, three blocked arteries and, you know, that, yeah. that ought to say something. So, so I'm hoping that, uh, that all that I'm doing today with my medication, eating right, start trying to do what I got to do is going to help me to get back to where I need to be. Yeah. Well, I, I wish you luck, man. Cause we need you here. We need you here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, I appreciate you coming on with me today. You know, it was a lot of fun. Got a lot of good information and uh, information about Connecticut that I didn't know, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Being out here in Cali. It's, good, it's a good place, man. We got a couple of casinos, man. Got to come out here one day, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got family and, uh, you know, I took a trip out. Me and the family took a trip out to New York. 
know okay. that a few summers ago. So okay. uh, we didn't yeah. get out to Connecticut, but you know, yeah, uh, yeah we yeah. want to do we want to do all that. That's the bucket list. Yeah. That's okay. the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you. Um, you know, you be safe out there. Keep keep up with your with your work, your diet, and all that. And you know, stay Absolutely. safe. Absolutely. Stay safe. Absolutely. I'm definitely gonna have to return the favor, have you on my show, man. We got to do yeah. something, man. So uh let's let's I'm, do it. I appreciate I appreciate you uh what you're trying to do, man. I, I really do. Yeah, man. yeah. I think it's important. I think it's important. So so give me the name of the uh of the website of the of the podcast, of your Instagram, all that. Okay. So uh the website is hunterpolicetraining.com, hunterpolicetraining.com. Uh so I'm on uh, Instagram, that's CPT, just think of Captain. CPT L Hunter, um, Twitter, same thing. CPT L Hunter, uh, the podcast once again is Cap- Captain Hunter's podcast. That's available on uh, iTunes or Apple, whatever it's called these days. Google yeah. Plays, Spotify, all of them. Uh, yeah, it's all wherever uh, podcasts are available. Also, uh, Captain Hunter's podcast on YouTube as well. I'm putting more more YouTube videos out. I'm trying to make sure that I, before I was doing just all audio, but now I'm going to start recording video recording as well. Put those up there. So there's a few up there right now. And so those are the platform: YouTube and uh, just uh, uh, you know audio podcast. And uh, once again, the uh, the name of the company is LMH Police Training and Consulting. The website is HunterPoliceTraining.com. And uh, email is cptlhunter at gmail.com. Um, IG is cptlhunter, Twitter, cptlhunter. And that's it, man. You're all yeah. over them, all over them. Yeah, well, listen, <laughs> I, I, I tried to do everything that they said to do, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, good having yeah. you on again, sir. And, uh, you know, be safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely, man. Thanks right. a lot, so right. much for having me. Take care. All right, you guys. I know it's been a minute since I've done this segment, but you know what time it is. This is Props for Cops. Give me more props, yo. More than a cop, yo. Till I master hip hop, I won't stop, yo. And this segment of Props for Cops comes to us from the ATL. That's right, the Atlanta Police Department, where 27 year veteran officer Veronica Campbell did something really special for a mother of five out there. Officer Campbell donated her own personal vehicle to that mother of five. Officer Campbell said, I had a vehicle. And I just decided to give it to her and she would be able to put it to better use than me. I knew that this mother needed a new lease on life and she needed to know that the Atlanta Police Department had officers willing to make the sacrifice when they go out into the community. I salute you, Officer Campbell. You are a shining example of what a police officer needs to be in 2020. Thank you for being you. Yes, indeed. That was episode 30. That's right. Episode 30 of the Black and Blue Podcast. I want to thank my guests on this episode, retired Waterbury, Connecticut Police Captain Lawrence Hunter for joining me on this momentous episode. Thank you for coming on, sir. I really appreciate you. And hey, guys, Captain Hunter's got his own podcast, too. So make sure you check out Captain Hunter's podcast on all the major podcast platforms. I want to thank you guys out there as well. Thank you for helping this show grow exponentially every episode. I appreciate each and every last one of you. Thank you. And hey, if you want to continue to see episodes just like this one, make sure you like and subscribe to the show on the Black and Blue Podcast channel, on YouTube, or whatever podcast platform you hear my voice today. And make sure you check out Black and Blue Live. You know, that's the live version of this show where me and my co-host Lizzie Green sit down and chop it up with panels of guests about all sorts of things. So we do that on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Periscope. And, uh, you know, we do that live every week. So make sure you check that out. The Black and Blue Podcast will be back next week with another interesting guest. So till then, you all already know. Stay black and blue. I'll holla at you. Peace. Thank you.